Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 215th episode of our first run through Book of Hours on YouTube, uh, playing as the artist. Um, I can't remember if I said at the start of this week, but I'm recording these on the anniversary, one year anniversary of Book of Hours. I don't recall when the exact one year anniversary for this series goes, because I know I was recording things uh, a little bit off and I was doing the, um, the stream uh, for the uh, sort of the base game as well. Um, incidentally, uh, for those of you curious, this is what my save um, save looks like. So, uh, in addition to all of the um, all of the like the YouTube, the streaming stuff, effectively every stream that I have been doing for Book of Hours is in here. Now I'll be getting rid of the like. The YouTube stuff when I delete that and you know the steam and things like that um, the plan here especially because the game records all of the histories that you record my intention is to go through and complete every single one of these saves it may not be a comprehensive run through it it may not be something that um, you know I go into as much detail as this it may be something that I do on a stream rather than I do you know do on a um, uh, on some kind of a, um, like ba basically it may not be a series like this, but the intention is to try and build up a, a kind of a list of histories uh, that I do. And I think that'll be, at least for me, uh, that'll be fun to be able to sort of look back and have some memories over a few of these. But let's focus on finishing off the summer. Again, our main focus here has been to uh, try and get the... Oops. Try and get the uh, the visitors in and try and find somebody with Hyksos. Uh, we have been going through all the different rooms. So we finished the Violet Chamber. I've uh, been moving up. Right, we were on to the Dueling Chamber. So Fraser's Plast Practice Sword. the weather today clouds <laughs> so much fish send him back I just don't think I'm gonna need to um, I'm not gonna need to interact with my pets that much Fraser's Practice Sword, a varnished length of wood, the name Fraser, has been carved into the flat. The wood is dark ash. The practice weapon has seen considerable use. It is notched and battered. It must be more than 50 years old. All right, Azita's Practice Sword, a varnished length of wood. The name Azita is inlaid in silver. The wood is Cornish oak. This is one of the newer items in the practice room, no older than the current century. Mirad's practice sword. The varnished length of wood, the name Mirad is inlaid in gold. The wood is Cornish oak. This is one of the newer items in the practice room, no older than the current century. I imagine that it's going to sort of double um, double up for each of these, but we'll still investigate them. So, Dear Day's Foil. A pin-sharp length of flexible steel. This blade is inscribed Dear Day. Out. Dear Day was one half of the edge dyad that Natalia Brulot hoped to lure to Hush House to learn from them or to imprison them. Torg's foil. A pin sharp length of flexible steel. The, pay, uh, the blade is inscribed Torg. Torg was one half of the edge dyad that Natalia Brulot hoped to lure to Hush House to learn from them or to imprison them. Red Quarter Staff, a long staff marked with bands of red. Wood is birch, the bands are marked with red ochre. To 
Dappled quarterstaff. A long staff marked with bands of black and white. The wood is poplar. The bands are blackthorn and holly. Alright, that didn't take too long, so we'll start with the match fl uh, flintlock pistols. A pair of pistols in the style and maker's... Sorry, the style and maker's mark suggest late 17th century. The initials MD are carved in silver above the wolf's agent of the Baron's Brankrug. There's a story that Musgrave de Wolf died in a secret duel with a Welsh visitor. There's nothing to suggest that this is true or that these pistols were ever used in a duel, but the date might match and one might speculate. The Poacher's Bow, a very practical weapon. Supple Cornish Ash, or Supple Once, it hasn't been used in years. It'd probably snap in two. And the Hunter's Bow, a very practical weapon. Night has fallen, dawn will come soon. Definitely getting rid of the sand. <laughs> And we will put away the old moment. Sorry, one thing I am neglecting to do here, it's, it's worth noting, right, that some of these things gave both scent and sound, so not all of this is sight and touch. I should actually be taking the time to show you what some of these things get, because I know a few of the, I've been interested in the, uh, in the text, but I'm sure a few of you are actually interested in the resulting um, cards as well. So, the Hunter's Bow, a very practical weapon, Stout English Elm, or Stout Once. It hasn't been used in years, it'd probably snap in two. This one gives us touch. Okay, so we should be on to Autumn now. Again, we're kind of crashing through the seasons uh, intentionally. Also, did we get an Oriflam's offer? I don't feel that we did this season. What's happening in the world beyond Brankrug? What visitors will the season bring? Uh, let's take... Ba -ba 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 -ba. Green's Practice Sword. And it's a storm, so that means we can make some Iker Auroral. Green's Practice Sword, a varnished length of wood. The hilt is charged as if Green had held it over a candle flame. Touch. Craft is learnt through the tips of the fingers. Okay, the Red Drake Shield, painted leather riveted to heavy iron. Arthur Moore! <laughs> He knows Sabazine, he does not know Hyksos. Hero, pilgrim, traitor. He'll always be a soldier, but never again can he be only a soldier. So we'll talk with him, give him what he wants. Good day to you. May I come in? Labites are much favored at the Labyrinth of Lions. Abicassus himself made a pilgrimage there not long ago. When they break faith with the Lionsmith, the duty often falls to me and my companions. The duty to bring them to the Labyrinth for punishment. Uh, the Red Drake Shield, There's this is clearly a reproduction or facsimile, perhaps from the mid-19th century, but it is heavy and durable. The leather is strongly textured, with small scales arranged in a diamond pattern. The Green Stag Shield, painted leather riveted to heavy iron. And to slay a Labite, that is difficult. To take a Labite alive, that is difficult enough to bring me here to you for help. 
So he will be happy with a four edge text. Although I think we've, yeah, we've already given him something. So that suggests to me we don't have low level edge. High endeavors of the noble, uh, sorry, high traditions of the noble endeavor. A blandly positive work on the Endeavor Club published by the Endeavor Club. The club was founded in 1862, but claims to draw from much older traditions. I am resolved not to fail in this matter, but what will become of Abicassus and the coils of the labyrinth, I cannot say. Out. Okay, this is clearly a reproduction or a facsimile, perhaps from the mid-19th uh, century, but it's heavy and durable. The leather is fine-grained and subtle and may, in fact, be deer hide. A golden lion shield, painted leather, leather riveted to heavy iron. Again, we're not going to worry about uh, turning that into Porphyrin until the time comes. Now, I'm not going to add Arthur Moore to the writing case quite yet. And this is because I uh, don't want to overwrite the occult scrap that I currently have. This is clearly a reproduction or facsimile, perhaps from the mid-19th century. But it is heavy and durable. The leather is stiff and coarse. It might be cowhide or perhaps even lionhide. All right, the wine dark chair. I think this is going to be one of the ones that Van Loren destroyed. There were 12 of these, but Gervinus Van Loren had most of them broken up and burnt the week after his arrival. Bad memories is all he would say. On to the dappled practice sword, a leaf shapen wooden sword of considerable age. What is popular, the hilt is marked with blackthorn and holly, which gives us sound. The red practice sword, a leaf-shaped wooden sword of considerable age. The wood is birch, the hilt is marked with red ochre, which gives us scent. All right, more bows, sentry's bow. Uh, fearsome weapon, good Welsh yew once, now it's rotting from the inside out. Uh, we did have enough time to do the crossbow, but I'm gonna, I'm not gonna tempt fate here. All right, contraband jetsam, so we'll take a brief pause on our investigation to open up this package. That's the foggy day. I don't think I have any use for it right now, but I'll I'll keep it in mind if uh, I do need. To. I am going to pay attention to whether or not um, Oriflames comes calling. I realize for a room that's as large as the dueling hall, there's a lot of items, so I don't get to read as much of the history of the house. 
All right. Um, skin Shock Mead is definitely not something to complain about. It's just I don't have any direct use for it because I'm not hosting anything right now. So I'll... Uh, I, I don't want to sound ungrateful when I get stuff like this because obviously under most circumstances it's quite helpful. Uh, but because I'm so late in the game, um, very powerful things like getting Skin, skin Shock Mead just doesn't quite hit the same way. And this is one of the drawbacks... This is, in fact, one of the things that I think uh, House of Light is intended to overcome, which is this idea that um, I obviously made a decision not to get Hyksos because I wanted to satisfy all the visitors. Clearly, that was not a good decision. Um, in retrospect, now knowing how, uh, how rare Hyksos is or how rare people with Hyksos uh, are when they come to the house, um, it's really something that I should be grabbing more or less at any opportunity. And of course, the nice thing about House of Light is that you it's no longer an either-or proposition. You can satisfy your visitors' wishes, but they will give you a calling card. And so as long as you have the ability to, uh, to write a letter to that person, you'll be able to bring them back and, um, and get the lesson from them there. So that's a system that I kind of prefer. I, I wasn't actually as worried about this idea. I know some people had commented that the um, they wanted more closure in terms of some of the stories. I wasn't too worried about that. But um, this idea of uh, of being able to um, to bring in some people who might. Well, I mean, the other thing, too, is that, you know, there is there is something to be said for the solitude of Hush House. But to be able to have some kind of correspondence, to be able to reach out to that broader world. Uh, and particularly in a way that doesn't make you feel like, you know, you have to choose between your duties as a librarian or, um, you know, advancing languages or something like that. I, I think there is something nice there. Like, I, I do think for the most part, House of Light kind of keeps some of the things that I think were good intact while removing a few of the, uh, the stumbles in terms of uh, language and such. Okay, a crossbow, an antique crossbow from Hush House's early baronial period. Still in excellent condition. I, in the unlikely event, I will ever need to fend off robber knights. I could do worse than this. And I believe we're now on to Sebastian's swords. Matching 18th century cutlasses, the initials SD are engraved on the blade near the hilt. The hilt is bone, the guard is brass, decorated rather racily with nymphs pursued by satyrs. Uh, they were not regulation Royal Navy pattern and must have been gifts or commissions by Captain Sebastian de Wolf, last of the de Wolf line, who died in action at Kyburn Bay. I have a reference to that up in HMS Karasham, a fourth rate ship of the line, captained by Sebastian de Wolf in the Battle of Kyburn Bay, lost with all hands. Okay. Um, this is the this is the room that we're starting with. So, Pale Chamber, in the time of the DeWolves, this magnificent bedroom was reserved for the Baron, or in later Ava's time, the Baroness. Ava had the whole room decorated in black as a gesture of permanent mourning for her father Valentine, or, according to rivaled rumors, to set off her own paleness for her lovers. It was Kitty Mazarine much later who freshened the furnishings and made it the Pale Chamber. Investigate the object. You won't use this up or consume it by doing this. The sea green sofa here, Lady De Wolf, would weave her intrigues and satisfy her secret craving for sentimental novels. Lord Franklin Bancroft, Magus, and Rake was a frequent visitor to the Hush House, and his name was often linked with Lady Ava's. He provoked scandal with a lubricus incomnium, thy throne malachite, dedicated to this very item of furniture. Lady Ava took this badly, withdrawing Bancroft's invitation to Christmas dinner, but relented in time for her spring ball, on condition he attend dressed entirely in green. <laughs> Ooh. 
The Daybreak Clock, a particularly unrepentant example of the Rococo style of the mid-18th century. Ambrose Westcott loved this clock. Most of his successors thought it was hideous, so it's been quietly shuffled from room to room where they didn't have to look at it until it ended up here. Don't think we have time for another round at Crow Cross Sands, so we'll just leave that there. We will, however, move... Yeah, no more furniture in this room, so we will move up to the Hall of Division. Ava DeWolf first furnished this as her Hall of Division, holding feasts where the guests were selected by unusual and exacting criteria. Later, there is a Blake, seventh librarian, employed the speculist Pomander to add more mirrors. Lots more mirrors. Uh, and I did not actually recall the um, Pomander reference here, so that's a nice... It's a nice little follow-up. Chancel of the Abbey Church. The Church of the Unconquered Sun acknowledges only a handful of hours. Um, uh, the Sun in Rags or Splendor, the Menescate, the Madrigad, the, the Madrigad, the Watchman, and reluctantly the Wolf Divided. Any other so-called hours must be lesser powers, wicked impostors, or superstitions. So the Church denies two of the three hours of the Chancel. And yet it is the Chancel who are said to determine which of their peers qualify as hours. That's theology for you. Abbot Geoffrey decreed that all three should be venerated in this holiest of rooms. To avoid actual heresy, he would not permit any of the three to be named. That's theology too. Up we go to the Radiant Stair. The Watchman's Shrine here is decorated with the Eye Elagabaline, a controversial variant of the Watchman's Eye. The Elagabaline rites have always had a shaky doctrinal status. Uh, it would not have been, uh, not often have been seen, of course. These stairs were reserved for the choir monks who sang the Liturgy of the Hours, the ones permitted to enter the chancel. Still, it is a little surprising that the eye was allowed to remain when the monastery was dissolved and the aisle given to the DeWolfs. Uh, we already dealt with the carpenter's stool, so on to the bell tower chair. The church tower. The bells in this tower rang every Sunday, even in Solomon Husher's time, until Thirza Blake finally cancelled the services so she could save money by sacking the priest. This brought a deputation of angry locals from Brancrook Village, where there was a fearful superstition that when the bells of Brancrook fell silent, the bells of Yees could be heard. Serena Blackwood brought this chair up the church tower stairs to sit and read by candlelight. The stairs were tough on her knees, but she learnt that Governor Collars was unlikely to bother her here. I don't know if I ever checked the mop and bucket, so I know this is a tool, but I'm going to take a look. Oop. Looks like I forgot to preserve the old moment at some point. Mop and bucket, galvanized steel enriched with the stains of a dozen years of methodical mopping. Very, very, very faintly, even after all these years, the unmistakably, unmistakable yeasty, marshy odor of prophet slime. All right, we do have an offer from Oriflams. So the War of the Roads, 1451 to 1551, Willis Ford describes the War of the Roads, an event in a history other than our own in detail, from its beginnings as a martial philosophical dispute between the dawn and sunset roads of alchemy to a war which ravaged half of Europe. So we'll spend the tin spintria there. Oriflams thanks you for your custom. Uh, let's also get that old moment back. So I think Disciplines of the Scar works here. But it does have to be Lantern. I suppose I should wait for the weather. Okay, let's get back to work. 
So the clock tower, George Collars, governor of Brancourt Jail, oversaw the design and installation of this great clock with the reluctant help of the librarian Serena Blackwood. She might have refused outright had she known how he intended to reuse the horologist's techniques for his so-called condignator. An inscription on the greatest reel reads, Strike the Hours. Bells, Giver, Teller, Schur's Tongue, Lady Janice, and Great Paycock are the names of these bells, though they're older than the Abbey itself, and those names have certainly been corrupted over the years. By 1915, Schur's Tongue and Lady Janice were too cracked to ring, and the Suppression Bureau paid for them to be recast. Serena Blackwood's quick pro quo for the assistance she gave George Collars with his clock project. These are the sounds which may answer thunder. The Spire. Here Hendrik de Wolf met in secret with King Henry. Once the Bronze King, now Old Copper Nose for the Great Debasement, had ended the supremacy of the Leashed Flame, and Henry's heirs were no more than human. There is a story that Hendrik's son Thomas listened from the rafters, that three times he heard Henry ask his father to break a certain promise in the matter of Carriese beyond the wave, and the third time the father did not refuse the king. This, says the story, is why Thomas never liked to make a promise thereafter, for fear of breaking it. Okay, so I think we're on to our next column here. Servants' Quarters North. This was once the private chamber of the formidable Ernestine Peterhans, Seneschal of Brankrug. Baron Hendrick, and afterwards his son Thomas, would both descend the back stairs to visit her in person. For counsel, most said. For prayers, others insisted. Only the very foolish ever suggested there was any improper motive for their visits. Uh, we do have a severe chair. Unfussy marsh green upholstery. The chair is innocent of chair, uh, chairly secrets. Okay, I think we're good for... Oops. I think we're good for all the other items here. Stores. At the time of the Prayer Book Rebellion in 1549, Hendrik used this room as a prison cell for unfortunate locals, including the cunning man and rebel ringleader Red William, who had boasted of a curse he placed on Hendrik's heirs. There will be no seventh of his line. There is a story told in Brankrug Village that Hendrik came to speak with the imprisoned William in person, there will be no second of your line, he told him, and had him gelded there in this very cell and cast into the darkness of the caves below the house. There is another story that Ava de Wolf once answered an important suitor by bringing him here to this room and pointing out a stain upon the stones. Uh, now, I, this is an interesting one to hear in relation to the tower, because I do wonder if the curse of the de Wolfs had something to do with that broken promise, but I've never quite been able to, to close the loop on that particular story. Okay, plain stool, the most reliable object imaginable. How old is it? It's older than one might expect. Very faintly, a triple knot can be made out on the underside of the seat. All right, the librarian's quarters. When the Curia of the Isle acquired the deed to the abandoned DeWolf estate, Ambrose Westcott became the first librarian and had this cozy nook constructed above the north wing to fit his preferences. His successor, Kitty, preferred the room next door. She lamented that the reek of Westcott's pipe remained long after his death, and her successor, Solomon Husher, preferred the long tower for his own chilly reasons. But most librarians have enjoyed the peace and the sea view. So we will start. I think we've already seen the fringe lap, so maybe we'll um, we'll move on to the librarian's footstool. A sea color star ornamented footstool. Put your feet up. The house is yours. Your work may not be done, but you've earned a rest. Uh, librarian's armchair, the sea-colored star ornamented armchair. According to consistent tradition, this is the most comfortable chair in the entire house. Okay, we covered this room. 
I don't think there's anything here for us, but we will read it. So the chapter house. Here the monastic superiors would meet to manage the affairs of St. Brendan's and so to resolve its disputes. Here in 1349, the last trial of the last nuns of St. Brendan's took place. Two were executed for the murder of Abbess Nona, supposedly with perversions of the healing arts. Nona was the last abbess of St. Brendan's, and after the trial, the monastery never accepted female novices again. From the wide windows, the sea is always visible, beating on the rocks far below. And we have the solarium. This room was once for the meditation of favored visionaries. Here, White Matilda prophesied the victory of the Iron King in the Wars of the Roads, much as it would occur 300 years later. She got the name wrong, though. Restful seat, a dawn-colored seat for a solar congregation. Sit in serenity. Nine-wing clock. I know we've checked this one before, but... Flams, thanks you for your custom. Okay, so I'm going to set this aside. I'm going to need to make some decisions in terms of how I'm going to use this. This will actually be something great to start uh, next week's episodes off on. So what I'm thinking here, um, I'll actually, I can maybe talk about this um, before we finish for tonight. So I have my list of sort of a skill plan here. And one of the ones, so a good example of something that's going to be a bit of a heavy lift to bring up. We've got strings and songs. The harmonies of the lower skies are here reproduced. And I want to take that from five to eight. I think that's one of the, well, there's a couple of others that are high up like that. But that's uh, that's going to be a challenge, right? This takes heart and, uh, and sky. And essentially to go from five to eight, I'm going to need uh, five plus six, so 11, and then uh, seven. So we're gonna need a total of, ooh, wow, I really messed this up. All right, this'll do. Yeah, so uh, what was it? 18 uh, total memory. So this is the sort of thing I really don't want to do during NUMA. Now, um, again, I need to be kind of clear on what I'm doing here. So this is Menescate Reflections. We do have the skill. So this is going to get us Edge and Forge. So what I would want to do is sort of go through the list here and see the ones that are uh, viable options. So Edict's inviolable here. Well, that's Heart and Moon, so that's not really going to work. Again, we're looking for Edge and Forge. Um, so then if I go through, uh, Great Signs and Great Scars is a 7 to 8, so it's not the hardest thing for me to do, but still one that's, um, still one that's going to involve a lot of memories. Again, it's hard, uh, Grail and Knock, though, so that doesn't work. Sea Stories is Grail and Moon. Uh, Pentiments and Precursors is Grail and Scale. So anything that can go to level 8 is, um, not in, not in good shape. Now, Snow Stories is an interesting one because that one needs to go from four to seven. So it starts off quite low, but ends quite high. But again, this is a moon in winter, so that doesn't really uh, get us where we need to go. Um, Hill and Hollow, but again, I don't think that has the forge or the edge that we need. Applebright Euphonies we know is um, Sky and Grail. Aronoscopy is actually one that takes a big leap, but that's three to seven, so I wouldn't really want to follow up on that yet. I think the closest that I'm going to be able to get here would be Auroral Contemplations, because that has edge, and we need to take that from five to seven. So, and presumably with War of the Roads, that is a... Oh, you know what? We only get one level of that. So what might be interesting to do here is maybe we take a chance uh, with Numa. We try to bring Auroral Contemplations up to six, and then we use the Menescape Reflections to bring that up to seven. So in this case, I would maybe want to hold on to War of the Roads until after we level some things up in Numa. But again, I can make all of those decisions closer to the time. If, you know, if we're a few seasons away from Numa, then uh, there isn't as much point in hanging on to those. So as far as the... Uh, how's concerned we I know we I think we already knew the identity of the new king but I'm happy that we got through that this week we are almost done yeah so we just still have the contemplative seat and then we're done sort of the main body of the house 
I don't think there's much for us to investigate. I guess there's the plain stool, but we've already read the text for that. Um, I'll wind up reading it again, I'm sure, just because of memory problems. Um, but the, yeah, there's not as much furniture in the remaining room, so we should get through this pretty quickly. Um, and again, some of this is going to rest on Numa. Some of this is going to rest on uh, other things that I can spend the time on. So uh, I don't mean to suggest that the... Um, you know, the furniture and the paintings are the only things that I can look at. There's the tools. Um, if we get sufficiently desperate, I can actually just, like, investigate the shells and all the other things um, to see if there's anything exciting that comes out of it. I don't know if I could really sustain doing a full episode of that. But I think we've got a couple of things that are lining up for our, our kind of our interests and our main uh, our main focus. So I'm not too worried. And like I said, there's a break glass option that I have to force Numa if it really comes down to that. I'd just rather not um, because I I will want to take advantage of the Numa thing later. And if I can build some good foundations at the start, that just helps me. Um, that just helps me out later. Anyways, as always, thank you very much for watching and we will see you Monday for the next episode. Until then, take care.